Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are who you are, that you are enough for us, that you give us all that we need in Jesus. And may we look to you, may we look to Jesus for our hope, for our life, for everything. Father, as we look into your word today and and worship you in that way, may you use your truth to transform our minds, to transform our hearts, so that we can live that life, experience that life that is in Christ and in him alone. We praise you, Lord, for who you are and for what you've done for us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is uh, Nick Berard and uh, elder here at Grace and, and uh, we have the last week uh, uh, before Josh is back and if you were here last week, you got to see the video um, uh, of Josh, Molly and their kids and, and uh, letting us know that they've welcomed their fifth one into their family, Charles Joshua Weidman, I believe it is and uh, uh, it goes by Charlie, right? And uh, you know, I know Josh, Josh had, had mentioned in that video that his, his most fa- favorite preacher of all time was, was Charles Spurgeon, right? And he wanted to name him Spurgeon, but, but Molly kind of put the, put the brakes on that one a little bit and, and decide, okay, we'll go with Charles, okay, not Spurgeon. And you know, I, I, I would probably agree with Molly, you know, I mean, Charlie, that's a, I think that's a cool, it's a cute name. Spurgy? I don't, I don't know, it's kind of a gross name, actually. Kind of like the word moist. I just can't get with it. So, so they're, they're uh, enjoying Charlie and uh, pray for them as, as uh, they continue in this uh, new infant phase. And uh, boy, am I glad I'm out of that and, um, in my life. But, uh, but they could probably use sleep and, and strength and all that. But it's great that they could um, welcome him into the world about a week ago. So we're going to continue our time in John 18. John 18. Last week, if you were here, we got to have uh, Steve Whitlock uh, preach, and, and he did a great job. Um, and he was, uh, looked at John 18, and, and specifically in John 18, when Jesus was before Pilate, and, and there was this conversation that Jesus and Pilate has, and there's this one particular statement that Steve really took out of that passage to focus on, and it was Jesus' statement of, my kingdom is not of this world. And so he talked about that, and, and, and kind of the, he talked about the lie of discontentment in our lives, and, and how easy it is to be discontent. But as Jesus said, when he said, my kingdom is not of this world, we do not live for this world. And so therefore, we are content because there is a world still to come that we will be a part of. And um, so he did a great job there. Today, we're gonna kind of re- rewind just a little bit in John 18. We're gonna look at John 18, um, starting in verse one and kind of going through verse 27. And specifically, we are gonna look at Peter. And in this passage, this is probably, many of you are familiar with this, but this is where Peter denies Jesus three times. And we're going to look at that in light of, as the sermon is titled today in your notes, the denial of self-confidence, the denial of self-confidence. We're going to be able to look at John 18 and see the dangers of when you put your confidence in yourself, when you are operating in your life, in your own power, in your own self, and, and, and not surrendering to the Lord and not having your confidence in Jesus, what that could lead to and what that led to for Peter. You know, if, if you're like me, I have to just confess right up front. This is a, a topic um, that is probably one of my personally, one of my greatest struggles um, is, is being okay with me and what I can do, and, and, and not surrendering my life to the Lord to operate and live in his strength and his power. You know, we're all on this journey called life, and depending upon your story, and, and you know, you've grown up to a certain point, however old you are, and, and you have a past, you have a journey, and maybe part of that journey, if you're like me, is, well, you live for yourself, maybe for a good period of time, 
And so your confidence was in yourself. And that was either too much confidence or maybe you struggled with too little confidence. You know, we live in a culture. In this land of the USA, there's many wonderful things about this land, but I think something in our culture here in America that flies in the face of the gospel is that you should put your confidence in you in your ability, that it's really all about you. And as long as you focus on you, it's gonna be all good because you are great and you can do great things. That is, a, I think, a common message and theme in the culture that we live in. But literally, that flies in the face of what the gospel is and what Jesus did on the cross and what that means that we as followers of Jesus, that of why we say we need him and him alone. I looked up on Amazon about a couple of weeks ago. If you type in uh, self-help books in the search, it comes up with about 80,000 different books that you can buy that has to do with bettering yourself, putting time in yourself. There's a huge focus in our culture about me, improving me. Now, I want to be very clear. There's nothing wrong with you growing as a person and becoming better. That's great. But the question is, what are you growing in? You know, again, for the world, that's fine. You know, if, because if, if the world doesn't embrace Jesus, then all they have is themselves, really, ultimately. So it makes sense that that's a message that is delivered from the masses around us. But when it comes to the gospel, we come to realize that when I put my confidence in myself, that will lead to pain, that will lead to bad things. And that's what we're gonna look at here in John 18. So if you wanna open your Bibles to that, we're gonna read uh, verses one through uh, 27. We're gonna skip 19 to 24, um, because that's not the the story of what's going on with Peter. It's uh, uh, Jesus before the high priest. But we're gonna read that, and then after we read that together, then I'm going to put on the screen a few other verses from the other gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because in this, in this scene here that we're gonna look at, this of Jesus, he just came from the garden. There was that time where he was praying for the church. There was, he was praying before his father, preparing himself to go to the cross. So John 18 really transfers us into Jesus. He's now on the way to the cross. And so in this, there's a few other pieces within the other gospels that highlight this interaction that Jesus and Peter have that we're going to also look at. And so we'll, we'll do that right after we read this. So if you would follow along with me, we're going to read. So John 18 verse one says this, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I and he, he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you you gave me that I have lost me that I I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, he drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. For they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. This would be John. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, 
went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of these men's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. And then we'll go to 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. So we get a glimpse there of what's going on in this scene. They're in the garden. Judas, because he sold Jesus out, led these officers to Jesus in the garden. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He was prepared for it. And then we see Peter in the interaction when the officers want to arrest him. He kind of freaks out, cuts off one of the soldier's ears, and Jesus looks at him and says, what are you doing? Put your sword away. I'm doing what God has called me to do. And Peter doesn't get it yet. He doesn't get it yet. Then they take Jesus away, and kind of Peter's following in the distance. He's following in the distance because he loves Jesus. He really does. And he, he wants to see what they're going to do. And so he follows, and then he gets to the place where the high priest is, and he can't go in because he doesn't know the high priest, but John, he does, so he goes in. So Peter's outside. I'm sure he doesn't expect to be called in. He's probably caught off guard a little bit, and he goes in, and then there's this interaction. And this interaction that we read here does not take place. It's not like these, these three questions are asked immediately. At least between the second and the third, there's a few hours of time that's spaced out between these interactions where Peter denies having any affiliation with Jesus. Then we see in some of the other accounts, I'm gonna read these if you look up here on the screen. Matthew 26, now this is before we get to the scene here in, Matthew, in John 18. It says this, and when they had sung a hymn, so this is when um, the disciples and Jesus were together, they went out to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you, Peter, will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. That's some confidence right there. And all the disciples said the same. They were all on board. We'd never deny you, Lord. We'd never deny you. Then in Luke, Luke 22, in this same interaction, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And then in Mark 14, he says, and he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, this is when he's in the garden praying. He says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, he was sleeping. He said, Peter, said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping again, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer to him. And he came the third time and said, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? And then Mark, as he said, again, so says, it is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So that's all before we got to this passage. Then at the end, 
Here's the accounts that we see here in Luke. This is when he denies me. He says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. This is Luke twenty-two sixty-one. 61. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Then Matthew 26, and it says, then he began to invoke a curse on himself and he began to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crows and Peter remembered the saying before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So those other accounts give a little bit more of a picture of where Peter is, where Peter and the other disciples are. So as we saw before John 18 begins, that when Jesus is with his disciples and he tells them, you're all gonna fall away. You're all gonna fall away. And there's a few takeaways from this scene that I really want us to focus on and highlight that are really going, going on regarding Peter in particular and his confidence, whether it's his overconfidence in himself or when he's operating in fear, but his confidence is still in himself and the results lead to the denial. So the first takeaway here, and this is found in Matthew 26 that we read, is his self-confidence, this is in your notes, his self-confidence sets him up for a massive failure. And really, it's his self-confidence of what he said in Matthew 26 when Jesus said, you're all gonna fall away. And he said, you know what, Lord? All these guys might deny you, but there is no way. I will die before I deny you. So Peter has this, has this sense of self-confidence in his personal strength that, you know what, no way. I love you too much. There's no way I'm gonna deny you, Lord. But Jesus says, then he says right back to Peter, before the rooster crows three times, Peter, you will deny me. After the crows three times, you will deny me. Now, I can only imagine the bit of disgust that Peter must have felt after Jesus still said, nope, you're gonna do it. Maybe there's feelings of, wow, don't you know me, Jesus? Don't you know that I love you? Well, what's ironic is Jesus is preparing to, go the, to do the very thing to cover for the sin that Peter is about to commit in denying Jesus. But Peter, being very disappointed, right? And, and then he moves on, right? They move on, but there's this massive kind of self-confidence that, that, that leads to this denial part. But not only leads to the denial, it leads to him also cutting off the ear of the officer. And we're gonna get to that in a second. But one of the things I think from a takeaway that we can look at is to see, do we as, as believers, as those who, who follow Jesus, do we understand, do we really get our brokenness, right? And our need to really put our confidence not in ourselves, but in Jesus and in him alone. You see, because Peter thought, no, there's no way I would do that. Have you ever thought to yourself, maybe you're, you're looking at an outside circumstance of something, whether you read it in the news or maybe something of someone you knew did something that in your mind was just, wow, they went off the deep end. And you know what? I would never do something like that. I think we need to be very careful in what we think we would never do. I'm reminded in scripture, as we look at the life of Peter here, I'm reminded of other accounts in scripture about the disaster that can happen when we as believers think that, oh, it's all good. I would never go do that. I think I'm reminded of the story of David, King David, who was, if many of you are familiar with scripture, the man after God's own heart. This was a faithful man but he was the king. And there, there came a point in his life as king where I think he grew a little bit too confident in himself. And if you know the story between him and Bathsheba and what happened there in that account, this is the man after God's own heart. And he goes on this downward spiral of decisions in his life that he has to pay dearly for. As he has, takes another man's wife and then it leads to then him being in, in, uh, responsible for killing her husband. And then a child, his child is lost. 
there's these immense consequences that David experiences because of this. And this is the man after God's own heart. And we need to be people who are okay with being broken and being weak and knowing that. Because in knowing that in my weakness, that's really where the Lord's strength is made known in our lives. In the verse, there's an amazing passage in 2 Corinthians where it says this. I'm gonna read 2 Corinthians 3, verses four through six. It says, such is the confidence that we have in Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but, we are, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the, not, not of the letter of the spirit, for the letter, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So the apostle Paul is talking about that we put our confidence in Christ. It's in him that we are great. It's in him that we grow and become better. Because you see, when we put our confidence in ourselves, that does not lead to the life that Jesus has for us in him. So self-confidence, whether it's, hey, I'm, I'm all that in a bag of chips, or whether it's, you know what, I really struggle with confidence. Whether it's a lack of confidence, all of that really ultimately is about you. It's about you operating in your own power, in your own self, in your own confidence. But you see, when our confidence is put in the Lord, the way that we live our lives is just a sweet aroma to him. And we're going to talk about that. But we need to look at from the life of Peter, who again, this was a man who loved Jesus, right? I mean, he followed him. He was one of his closest disciples. He was the one who stepped out of the boat, who had the faith to step out of the boat and walk on water, right? This was a guy who was very close, who loved Jesus. He didn't necessarily intentionally turn his back on him. But we see early on before the denial that he had too much confidence in himself. The second takeaway that I want us to look at is that when Peter should be relying upon God in prayer, he falls asleep. He falls asleep. So Jesus takes him and a couple others into the garden and Jesus goes to pray with his father. Peter and the other disciples with him fall asleep. Jesus wanted them to pray so that they would be ready for what is to come. And they fell asleep. And so again, there is this sense of confidence that, oh, you know what? We're tired. We're tired, so we need some sleep. Not really understanding that what the power of prayer would be able to prepare them for maybe didn't necessarily have to make certain decisions down the road that were made. Prayer, so important. Ultimately, prayer is, is in our hearts. It's that, it's that response of, God, I need you. I need you. And we need to take notice of that. How much do we need God? How much are we coming before him in prayer? Or if you're like me, I've, there's many times where in prayer I've just literally fallen asleep. It's a whole nother thing. But what are the other things in life that get in the way that we think are more important than spending time with our Lord, inviting him in, in prayer? That's the second thing I want to highlight. The third thing to take away from Peter is Peter allows his emotions to guide his decisions because he is the one in control. You know, this is interesting because in John 18, verse 10, that's where when they're in the garden and Jesus is about to be arrested, Peter freaks out. You know, I can imagine he's like, I'm gonna show Jesus my dedication to him. I'm gonna show him how much I'll go to bat for him. And so he responds, and in a, in a very emotional response, draws out a sword and cuts the dude's ear off. You want to talk about getting in trouble? Wow. He cuts a guy's ear off because he wants to protect 
Jesus from being arrested. And what's Jesus' response? He looks at him and he says, put your sword away. And it's almost like, Peter, you still don't get it. You still don't get it. And this is Peter having, I think, a, a good motive, right? He's protecting Jesus. He doesn't want him to be arrested and then to be tortured and, and killed. He doesn't want that. And so he steps up to the plate, but his emotions, because he's the one in control, he, he allows his emotions to gain control of the moment and reacts harshly. Have you ever done that? Man, I, I, you know, one of the things that God uses in my life um, in a great way to show me how much I can just react to my pure emotions is in my relationship with my kids as a father. You know, uh, love my kids, love them to death. Love you guys, right? But sometimes they don't listen. They don't follow directions, right? And as a parent, it's so easy to respond purely from an emotional standpoint. Now, I have their, like Peter, I have their, I love them, right? I, I am, for the most part, doing it, I think, for good reasons. Some of it's because I'm angry, right? Just to be honest. But, but you know what? I love them, and I, I want what's best for them, right? And so, you know, when I respond emotionally to them, I yell at them at times, you know, because they're not listening to me. But I know that in, in doing what I'm doing in those moments where I at times fail as a father, because I'm responding purely from an emotional standpoint. It's a very dangerous thing, I think, for us is to live in our emotions. And I think that's what can happen, like Peter, even if our intentions are good, is that when our confidence is in ourselves and we're the ones in control, that when things happen that are out of our control or that things that we don't want to happen, it's so easy to respond purely from emotion. That's natural. That's normal. But is that the way that we are to respond? Whatever the situation is, parent to child, friend to friend, husband to wife, boss to worker, whatever it may be, our emotions can fail us and betray us a lot of times. Emotions aren't bad. But again, when our confidence is in ourselves, they can lead to bad things. And that's what happens here with Peter as he draws his sword and cuts the ear off a soldier. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand the greater picture here. And Jesus points that out. The fourth thing I want us to take away from this interaction with Peter is Peter allows fear to drive his decisions and his denial of Jesus, right? So now we get to that part where what Jesus said he would do happens. And he's following from the distance, right, as Jesus is taken away, as he's arrested. And he looks and he says, okay, well, I'm going to see what's going on here. I love this man. Well, we see that when he's pressed the issue, because there, there is an issue, there, there is a physical consequence for Peter if he's associated with Jesus, because he too could face imprisonment. He too could even face death. That's a pretty fearful circumstance, right? And left to yourself, I don't blame him. I mean, if you think about this circumstance where he is now put to the test, but because his confidence is in himself, now fear kicks in because Jesus is before the high priest. He's been arrested. So now there's actual physical consequences to me affiliating myself with him. And that's why he's kind of following from a distance, right? And then he has these three interactions. And of course, he denies him three times because of the fear that he's experiencing in the moment and the rooster crows. And as we see in the account in the other gospels, because John doesn't say this, but we see that he remembers what Jesus says and it just hits him in that moment, what he did. And it says he runs and he weeps bitterly. He has now done the thing, the very thing that he swore to his best friend Jesus that he would not do. And now the, the, the brokenness of the moment sets in and he begins to weep bitterly. 
If you ever done something that you were ashamed of, I'm sure all of us have, I've done more than I want to admit. But when you realize the weight of what you've done, as a believer, there is a brokenness there that starts to set in. When the spirit of God convicts us and we, we, we feel the weight of, oh no, what have I done? So those are, those are the four things in this dynamic, in this scene that we need to really kind of pull away and look at. Because I think if we're all honest, we are a lot like Peter. Peter did some awesome things, or the Lord did some awesome things through Peter. But Peter also did some things that he was very much ashamed of. And this is, I think, probably one of those highlight moments in his life that we can learn from, that we can look at and see, whoa, what's going on here? And so there's really, there's, I think, also four things in light of these four takeaways, these four things we can look at that we can learn from Peter's mistakes. It's a beautiful thing about God's word is we can see so many people in the Bible in so many ways were failures. And that's great because so often we too are failures. But we have an amazing savior shepherd, right? But we can resonate, we can relate to in some way what Peter's going through. Now, I don't know if there's even anyone in here, may, maybe, but probably most of us have never experienced the same type of circumstance, meaning that someone comes up to you and because you have an affiliation with Jesus and you deny him because your life is in danger. In this country, mm, right? Now, it's a reality in today's day and age in other parts of the world. That's a reality. But probably for most of us here, that's not necessarily the reality that we've faced, right? That because our life is in danger like Peter, we, we literally denied being affiliated with Jesus. However, how often do we not say something to someone that we should share about and talk about Jesus with because we're afraid? Or how often, because our confidence is in ourselves and we're really not living and following and pursuing Jesus, that, you know what, the way we live our lives does not, in a sense, it's a denial of who he is, right? We're too comfortable in who we are. We're too comfortable in the lives that we have here in, in, in Inglewood, Colorado, or Lone Tree, or Highlands Ranch, or Parker, right? We have so many of these comforts in life, it's so easy just to settle in and just live how we want to live. That's the natural, normal thing for us to do. But I want to challenge us that we can learn from Peter and, and that we can look at and say, Lord, where is my confidence in? The first thing I want to point out is that our confidence is found in Jesus, not in ourselves. And that's that 2 Corinthians 3 that I read earlier. Our confidence is not in ourselves. When we put confidence in ourselves like Peter, that leads to bad things. Whatever those things are, those, those events, those decisions are, it's not gonna be good when we put our confidence in ourselves. Or our confidence needs to be in him and in him alone. The second thing that comes off from the second takeaway is that prayer individually and with others within community keeps us close to Jesus. In Philippians 4, I want to read this. It says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in all things, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and protect your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So this aspect of prayer, you see Peter was falling asleep, but God is saying, when we pursue him in prayer, when that is, when we're saying, God, I need you, and this is a daily invitation for us, moment-to-moment -moment invitation to be able to come before him and say, God, I need you in this, or I just need you today. I'm surrendering my life to you today because I need you. It prepares us. The Spirit prepares us to be able to live out that moment or walk in that day in a, in a way that's led by the spirit and not by, oh, I've got this today or I've got this in this situation. Prayer is huge for us to be able to place ourselves before the king of kings so that the spirit of God 
can lead us. What an amazing invitation to come before him. And I know prayer can be a very, at times, um, daunting thing. It can be something that it's just not comfortable. It's, but I'll, I will tell you this, and I, I am far from an expert in prayer, but I've come to a point in my life to experience prayer in a way that when God meets you in prayer, oh, does he prepare you for what he has Oh, does he begin to give you the wisdom that you need, the eyes to have, to see the things as you're walking throughout your day of what he wants you to see. May we be people who take that step of faith and say, God, I don't even know what to say right now, but I need you, but I need you. I wonder what would happen if Peter would have done that in the garden. When we put, the third thing I want us to learn from Peter's mistake is, when we put our confidence in Jesus, our emotions don't lead our decisions, Jesus does. When we put our confidence in Jesus, those emotional responses that are so easy to just react to, we can just sit, and by the wisdom that is given to you in the very moment by the Spirit of God, you can respond in a way that is godly and that is, is good and is for, if it's with another person, it's for that other person's good. And you're, you can set an example of what it looks like to walk through maybe a difficult circumstance where your emotions aren't ruling you. And that's what Jesus does. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, it, is, it again prepares us not to live in our emotions. We can learn from that. We can grow in that. I think the fourth thing that we can learn from Peter's mistakes is that Jesus's love and perfect love drives out fear in our lives. In 1 John 4, 15 through 18, it says this, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is also, we, but because as he is also, are we in this world? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. You see, when we put our confidence in Jesus and not in ourselves, when fear kicks in, when in the heat of the moment, you're going through something where where you know you're just, fear is starting to drive you. That is the very thing that when we abide with Jesus, we start to understand and experience what this love is all about. And in that love, that fear is not something that is driving us like it drove Peter to ultimately deny his savior. Ultimately deny his savior. So we can learn to say, wow, if I can just continue to put my confidence in Jesus and experience his love and grow in his love, then the fear that is so easily crippling and that can so easily drive us like it did Peter, we can walk through a very, what seems to be a very fearful circumstance in God's peace because of his love. So that's another thing we can learn from what Peter, what's going on with Peter. So I want to challenge you just with, as we close up here, I want to challenge you with an individual, um, his name is uh, Hudson Taylor. I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you are familiar with Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a missionary in China in the 1800s. And he ministered to the people, brought the gospel into this nation of China. And the Lord used him in amazing ways. But he also went through this kind of, this experience of first being a missionary where kind of he didn't really understand what it meant to really fully have all his hope and his confidence in Jesus. Well, there was a moment in in about 1869 where a letter was written to him as a missionary from a friend. And this letter was challenging him 
about what it means to have Jesus being our all, to have him being our confidence. And I'm going to read from you a portion from this book. This is what he says about this letter. He says, when my agony of soul was at its height, a sentence in a letter from dear McCarthy was used to remove the scales from my eyes and the spirit of God revealed the truth of our oneness with Jesus as I had never known it before. McCarthy, who had much exercised by the same sense of failure, but saw the light before I did, he wrote this, but how to get faith strengthened? Not by striving after faith, but by resting on the faithful one. And he goes on in this book to talk about what he calls the exchanged life. The exchanged life of what it means when you are all in with Jesus, when your confidence is all in on him and you're living for him, what that's all about and what it looks like. And there's a quote I'm gonna read that says, he says this, this is how kind of he summarizes everything. He says, how then shall a Christian bear fruit by efforts and struggles to obtain that which is freely given? No, there must be a full concentration of the thoughts and affections on Christ, a complete surrender of the whole being to him, a constant looking to him for grace. Christians in whom these dispositions are once firmly fixed go on calmly as the infant born in the arms of its mother. Christ reminds them of every duty in its time and place. He reproves them for every error. error. He counsels them in every difficulty and excites them to every needful activity. In spiritual as in temporal matters, they take no thought for the morrow, for they know that Christ will be as accessible tomorrow as he is today, and that time imposes no barrier on his love. Their hope and trust rest solely on what he is willing and able to do for them, on nothing that they suppose themselves able and willing to do for him. Such is the exchange life the abiding, fruitful life, the life that is Christ, which should be the possession of every single believer. Galatians 2.20 should be and can be a glorious reality. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, this exchanged life is all about us putting our confidence, our surrender in the risen Savior and not in ourselves. Because if whether we struggle with being overconfident in ourselves or whether we struggle with not having enough confidence, all of it, like I said earlier, is meaning we're putting the focus on ourselves But Galatians 2.20, as Hudson Taylor says, this can be a reality and should be a reality for every believer that we should be able to say, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What a beautiful invitation for us as his children to be able to say, wow, this is not about me. My confidence needs to be in him. And so if you are a husband or if you are a father or a mother or a wife, if you are a leader in business, if you are in your school, wherever you find yourselves, whatever roles you are playing in your journey in life, may you put your confidence solely in the Savior. Because as you walk out those roles that you play in your journey, you can live a life that reflects that you represent the King Jesus, Jesus, that it's him that lives in you, that it's not you, that it's all about him. Oh, and how he would prepare you and use you for glorious things, even in the midst of terrible circumstances, especially in the midst of terrible circumstances, that he would use you to be a salt and light into a dark and broken world that so needs the Savior. So is Galatians 2.20 something that you can, in your heart of hearts, say yes? That's my heart. It's not perfect, but you know what? That's my heart. And I think that ultimately that was Peter's heart. That while in this moment that we see in John 18, there was a struggle. He didn't quite get it. But if you read on, if you further read on to the story, oh, he gets it. We get a read in New Testament, 1 and 2 Peter, 
You can see in, in the book of Acts, you can see how Peter responds and ultimately how he lives out Galatians 2.20 in his life. And you know what? If you're here today and you feel like, wow, I'm a massive failure like Peter. Just like Peter though, God's grace is more than enough. God's grace is sufficient to put you right back into right relationship with him. And so I wanna encourage us to think about that exchange life, to live out that exchange life of Galatians 2.20. Oh, what God would do in our hearts and minds to transform us so that we can rest in his peace and so that we can know that my confidence is in him, not in myself. God, use us. That he, oh, that he would use us. There's a few things that I wanna encourage you with before I pray. In your communication card, there's responses. Three of them. The first one is to practice each day putting your confidence in Jesus in prayer. Practice that. But when you get up, when you're getting ready for your day, practice surrendering your heart to the Lord. Put your confidence in him. And you know what? Throughout your day, you may need to keep doing that. And that's fantastic. The Lord loves it when you come to him. Memorize Galatians 2.20. Allow the word of God to wash over your heart and your mind. Or read 1 Peter 1 to get a perspective on Peter. Josh is gonna talk about, actually, he's gonna end in John 21 in a few weeks. He's gonna cover John 21. And we're gonna see a beautiful thing that, Peter, uh, that Jesus does with Peter when he restores him. It's an amazing thing. But God's grace is always sufficient for all of our failures. So I encourage you, I challenge you, I exhort you to, to, to walk that out this week. Put your confidence in the Lord. And may he be the one who is honored in our lives. Let me close this in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are the one who sent your son, Jesus. And as we see here in John 18, we see the scene of this interaction between Jesus and Peter. Oh Lord, can we learn from this? Can we learn from some of the mistakes of someone who deeply loved Jesus, who deeply loved you, Lord? May you use this to continue to bring out transformation in our hearts and minds so that we as your children can experience your love more, can experience your grace more, and that's so that we know in our heart of hearts that it's not I who live, but Christ in us. May our confidence be in you and you alone. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen.